Yeah, and he says, plus one, not much content out there covering the space outside telemetry. Mm. And Roman was like, haven't listened to this one yet, but I wish we'd cover GNMI versus NetConf for network management outside telemetry. <laughs> outside telemetry was very specific in both cases here. So we better have some comments of it being outside telemetry. Well, the cool thing is that NetConf doesn't really have too much to do with telemetry outside of notifications, which were kind of like a bolt on. Oh, fuck. We missed the whole operational angle when we defined this interface. Fucking ram it in, boys. Ram it in. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Networking. This is uh, another episode of our best effort series, where we shoot the shit about random technical topics. This one, thankfully, has come from some feedback we got based on the recent data modeling episode. So uh, yep. I, I guess... Um, before we start, we'll do some intros. I am uh, just one part of your magnificent co-host duo here, uh, Bruce Wallace. And introduce yourself. I'm okay. <laughs> last last time you did it for me, so I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do it or not. I'm yeah. Alan James. All right. So uh, yeah, so we uh, we got a lot of good feedback uh, based on the uh, the data modeling episode uh, we recently recorded, and uh, some feedback where people wanted us to go a little deeper. So. I guess before we go into that, we'll, uh, cause the whole episode here is going to be based around, uh, one specific piece of feedback. Um, we'll go into some of the other comments we got before we get there. So, uh, one comment from, uh, Roman Doden, uh, or at NTDVPS on Twitter around CLIs following CLIs, CLI following the data model. <laughs> um, right. And I think we, we touched very briefly on that in the data model episode where, you made mention uh, of the fact that the open config uh, data model does not lend itself to a uh, very uh, easy to navigate CLI if the CLI were to be built directly off of the model. Yeah, and I guess Roman Roman's comment is was was that uh, you know on Twitter was that the CLI in his in his uh, in in his opinion the CLI shouldn't follow the model directly, but the CLI should be an application, uh, a separate application that may be consuming the model, but in it itself is not the model and or using the model directly. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my my thoughts on this, and I, I, I don't think we should spend too long on, on this because we do have a an, an episode, but I my, my thoughts, I, I do tend to agree for one, but I do think that there, uh, what I had in my head, and maybe I didn't articulate that well, is that there's kind of like this hybrid concept, right? Where, you know, there's a, a big part of the system is, you know, when you're on a system and you're debugging, part of that is show commands. Part of that is looking at kind of the configuration and what's there. And part of that is looking at the state. Um, and up until this point, before we had all these nice data models and we had separate data stores, the way to look at state was via a show command. And I think we've right. gone through a shift where that's not necessarily the case. Um, certainly show commands are still convenient ways of aggregating and, you know, doing joins across a bunch of different pieces of the data model and displaying things nicely. So show commands absolutely still have their place. And I agree that those don't need to follow the data model. Although I do think just from, from a muscle memory perspective, it is nice if they, if, if it makes sense to get them to follow the same schema, even if it's just an artificial representation of that schema. So that's kind of All right my thoughts on it. I do find that if the state data store is exposed in such a way that's easy to consume in the CLI, that the use of show commands goes down though. And I think that's, that's the shift that, uh, at least that's, that's the shift that I've undergone myself as I, uh, as we've moved into this model driven utopia. I don't know. Do you, do you agree with that or you have other thoughts? No, I think that's right. I mean, I, I tend to agree. I think the show command is still I think there is still something to be said for aggregating that data from different areas of the system and different models and uh, being able to even maybe do something more intelligent with the show command, maybe some comparisons or anything like that, that may not be just extracting the data, but actually like yeah, do some sort of logical function on the data before displaying it to the user. And so there is a function for a show command um, to do something like that. And, yep. and like you said, that doesn't necessarily have to follow the, uh, it's almost like, it's almost like saying, you know, putting the two together, it's almost like saying the show commands are a part of the CLI that really don't follow the model and are really a sep the, the separate application aspect, like the, like uh, Roman Cannon was alluding to. Um, but the configuration aspect of the CLI is more closely tied to the actual data model. And navigating yep. the CLI tree, like when you actually navigate the CLI tree, not through the show commands, but the actual configuration tree, and then that um, is 
tends to be nicer if it's following the data model. Yeah. I, okay. So I think uh, there's no real disagreement here. I think we're saying show yeah. commands don't have to follow the data model, but they should be derived right. from the data model. They should be sourcing Correct. from the data model, which means that they can be doing, like you said, they could be doing kind of more uh, advanced functions. They could be doing comparisons. They could be grabbing something from an interface, something from the routing table and matching the two together. I mean, they could be doing a lot more for sure. Um, and I don't think that there's any need for that to necessarily follow the data model for sure. I but what I don't, what I, what I, and just, uh, just not to spend too much time on this, but there, <laughs> there are network operating systems where you can uh, execute show commands as part of a remote like RPC, mm -hmm. and then get the output back in some sort of JSON formatted version of the show command. I think that I, I would rather stay away from doing things like that. And then if that's the case, you're better off querying the data model and the proper data store and the state retrieving the state directly rather than querying a you know, show command, which may not follow any data model. And it's just a matter of you knowing what the output may look like and then trying to format that output into some sort of like JSON or other, other, uh, formatted schema. But anyway, yeah. so, um, yeah. I, but because I, I do know you can do that with some operating systems and I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if kind info. of the utopia approach there is to allow the CLI to run off box and that way you're still, uh, the CLI just becomes that kind of normalization layer for you, right? In the same way you would want to run the CLI command off box and ingest the data by something, you could use the CLI as that interface rather than tech scraping. And uh, but, but actually, that's a good point. You end up going down that slippery slope, right? If you're wanting to do that off box, it's typically because you're trying to ingest it in some kind of application or some kind of machine-to-machine uh, -machine interface. And there's mm -hmm. much, much better interfaces for that. Like, I mean, if that hasn't been super clear from uh, from the previous episode, uh, I'm sure there's no disagreement between you and I that tech scraping is no bueno. We, no should, bueno. Not, and we should not be doing it, it. Correct. And hacking up the output of a show command in JSON is also not ideal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I re you remember the days, right? You run a show command and then you grep or you like awk for something, you ingest yeah. it. I want that line and the two lines after, and then I'm going to exactly. grab the second field from that line. And then, you then know, I'll, you... I'll remove the semicolon and then I'll yeah, open that yeah. into a string and then I'll be able to do something with it. Yeah. 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 We've all been anyway, there, guys. We all We've did all it. We've all been there. Yeah. yeah. But there are, there are and people ways. St we still do it. <laughs> we do for sure. I mean, this anyway, shout this. out to Roman. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the comment. That was, that was pretty good. And I think that he had a second comment, which actually leads us to this episode. So, um, maybe we'll get back to it before we get to that really quickly. Another shout out to, uh, Chris Logan on YouTube. He left us a YouTube comment, um, that had to do with the, uh, the fact that the data modeling world that we talked about and Yang and open config was a very utopian world, which we did mention numerous times. And, uh, in his yep. opinion, it seemed like, uh, no one outside of, you know, uh, Silicon Valley and the big uh, tier one web scalers would actually have the opportunity to really adopt uh, a fully, truly uh, modeled uh, operating system that could um, build into their into their automation framework. And then he felt that most people were today were still uh, leveraging SNMP and there would be a reluctance to move away from MIBS and SNMP until... Um, um, I don't know until when, but it just seemed like the the the, the present mode of operation seems to be in society. <laughs> exactly, it seemed to be, uh, in his opinion, seemed to be the the standard for quite a few years to come. Yeah, and I, again, I don't think there's any disagreement there. We do have the benefit, uh, at least uh, you know, with on this channel of uh, focusing mostly on what is next and what people should be doing as opposed to dealing with the baggage of the past, right? The baggage of the past is mm -hmm. real. I mean, yeah, you and I are conveniently ignoring it because it uh, it focuses on things that were done without focusing on the way things should be done. And at mm -hmm. least from a, from a uh, if, if anybody is gonna learn anything from this, it won't be about how things were done, despite a lot of our episodes being sometimes history lessons. Um, Although I do hope that, but I do hope that what people get out of it is the, is the uh, is the the notion that there are better ways of doing things and and the fact that you are doing something one way is not necessarily a reason to stay there uh, we've had a bit of a discussion around this recently but yeah. um and and that uh you know it, they should be looking to doing things differently and and not just settling on mibs and snmp forever you know what i mean and there should be some driver and some value add in in moving to a fully uh yang modeled world data models and, and leverage that in your, in, in your automation uh, frameworks and automation pipelines yeah. and automation scripts and automation uh, languages, whatever you're using. 
Yeah, and I think we we quite often in the networking industry focus on inflections as being kind of bumps and speeds or, you know, new chipsets coming out and, mm -hmm. and potentially consuming them. But, you know, you, you should think if you're an, an operator today, uh, the next time you're onboarding a new vendor or you're looking for your 400 gig upgrade path, use that as an opportunity to, to kind of understand where the management stack is going as well and try to try to, to to do what is right rather than what has been done is uh yep. would, would be my two cents there agreed okay and that does bring us to uh the main comment and the the reason we are sitting here tonight recording this episode which is um a comparison around gnmi versus netconf and i, I think we'll throw in restconf here just because it's uh it, it kind of goes hand in hand with these interfaces yep. um without a focus on telemetry, because that's obviously been the main focus of, uh, of I guess, more on the GNMI side than the NetConf side. Telemetry being a super generic word, and I don't think we need to debate what it means, just means getting state out of the box, whether it be yep. streamed or, or otherwise. So I guess uh, I've, I've done a decent amount of research on, on NetConf, so we can speak a little, a little more intelligently than we may have done in the last episode or, or otherwise. Uh, I know you've also done a little bit of research, so we can kind of compare notes, share some ideas. Um, I focus, like I said, a lot on the history of why NetConf was created and kind of the 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 industry momentum behind it. Although I I, I would have expected there would be more industry momentum. I, I will say that, like, it's not that there's none. There's a lot, and maybe it's for all the reasons that uh that Chris was pointing out. That you know we're just uh, we're relatively slow. We have a lot of brownfield, a lot of the tooling has been built around uh, SNMP and these these older style interfaces. So there's all reasons that could slow adoption. But NetConf has been around uh, A, longer than I thought. I thought it was mm -hmm. uh, much more recent. But um, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there and we'll we'll go through some of the history. So uh, there was a, uh, IETF holds like quarterly meetings and there was one held, I think it was either in 2001 or 2002. And it was around... Why has SNMP failed for configuration? Like it seems to be that was kind of the premise of the uh, of the meeting, and right. there were actually some good statistics that came out. Of it. They actually wrote like an informational RFC about the findings, uh, RFC thirty five thirty five. If anyone is uh, interested in going for a read, do recommend. It's pretty short, but uh, there were some interesting stats that came out of that, and one of them was that uh, seventy percent plus of uh, kind of network automations on the configuration side were being done using CLI scripting at the time. This was back in 2001, right. 2002, which is kind of crazy. Um, when, you know, SNMP was was fairly rich from a, from a MIB perspective, um, you know, we had SNMP v2 by then. So we had uh, we had better ways of, uh, I guess, bulk retrieving data. Um, mm -hmm. I guess that doesn't really solve the configuration problem. So maybe it's relevant. No, but I that's the thing, right? Like, I guess like SNMP was extremely widely used, but again, on the monitoring stand, on the monitoring front, right? Retrieval of data or SNMP traps, being alerted of some sort of state change or whatever it may be. Uh, and that's where SNMP really like took off. But yeah, I guess the, the downside or the, where it wasn't used as much is actually on that configuration aspect. Yeah. Yeah. So they wanted to define a new interface that was, that was focused on the configuration side of things. And you'll, you'll see as we go through some of the some of the stuff on NetConf today, I mean, it's heavily, heavily focused around configuration. Obviously, this was the good opportunity to move towards a, a new data model. So Yang being mm -hmm. the uh, the data modeling language of choice here. Um, and th there was a lot of innovations uh, in NetConf to kind of adapt to where CLI had already kind of transitioned to. This is one thing I noticed as I was going through these notes is a lot of the stuff we were doing through CLI, and I guess this paints the, the picture of why CLI was used predominantly for configuration it was bringing those into a kind of a machine driven interface. Um, right. So uh, the big ones that kind of stuck out for me were transactions, of course, that being a, like a, a huge reason that it, it needed to exist. And for those of you who, who aren't using kind of a transaction based uh, configuration model today, all this really means is that with classic SNMP, the way you push changes down to a device, and we did talk about this a little bit in the last episode, is you kind of set a bunch of OIDs. Um, mm -hmm. so you're always sequencing a change. And if you don't sequence that change correctly, you can get into kind of weird states. And, uh, it, often you end up with half completed configuration if you get midway through and something didn't work. So 
you know, the network management systems that were often driving the configuration, at least on the automation side, they kind of had to adapt, right? Like they would have to do like these crazy complex operations to figure out how to roll changes into the network. And I guess more importantly, when things break, how to roll how them to out. Them back. Yep. Yeah. So transactions are a super nice way to solve this and that you can stage kind of a, a transaction, a batch of changes, and then you apply them uh, in one single operation, which means they're all kind of batched together. They're easy to roll back. And you don't need to worry about the sequencing or any dependencies within that transaction because they all kind of go in at the same time. So kind of beautiful. And, and, you, and, you, and you rely on your network operating system to do that that sequencing and verification. So no matter what the order operations are in terms of your changes, you rely on your network operating system to do yep. the validation and checking that the correct order is in, in place and yep. it'll actually happen. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another another note, we'll, we'll come back to transactions because they are, they are very relevant, but... Another note, and I, I didn't really think about this until I was kind of reading up on NetConf, is there was no way to um, to kind of separate out configuration from state when you were trying to do something like a backup uh, with SNMP. So you imagine you do like SNMP walk and you grab like every OID and then you try to set them back. The vast majority of them are read-only, right? And there's, there's no right. way for you to, unless you kind of like crunch the model, the model being yeah. the 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 MIBs um, to figure out what is state and what is not. So uh, NetConf wanted to try and solve that as well, and the way that was kind of done was through these whole data store concepts, which uh, yep. which 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 continue through all these other interfaces, right? The concept of data stores. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them a, a NetConf innovation, but that was certainly the first interface to kind of define them and consume them. So we can give kudos back to NetConf for that. Yeah. Um. I guess uh, sequencing we already talked about. Um, one, one, one note that I, I thought was interesting was around the difficulty of NetComp versus SNMP from a usability perspective and from an implementation perspective, where SNMP is super, super easy to implement. You know, there's SNMP clients all over the show. It's very, very easy to build mm -hmm. a client, batch, you know, put it inside bash scripts. I'm sure you've, you and I have both written scripts that make, uh, make calls using SNMP. So those were nice and easy, um, but very hard to use for all the reasons we just talked about, right? Like all the sequencing and, and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Whereas NetConf was meant to kind of be the opposite and kind of flipping that model on its head. NetConf is actually quite hard to implement. Um, in the sense that, you know, it's, a uh, the interface is a lot more complex than SNMP. You know, you have to encode yep. things in XML and there's operations and you need to be calling RPCs and the, the structure is a lot more complex, I would say. Um, I, I would say like, certainly when, if you were coming from SNMP at the time, it would seem like a barrier, like a, yeah. quite a more complex system. Nowadays, I think that obviously that's a bit, you know, less of an issue. People have come to realization that they can just as, yeah. easily, as easily consume NetConf and something like GNMI uh, in a very similar fashion, and that's not as much of a barrier of entry. And so maybe then that's 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 contributing to the rise of SN, uh, of uh, NetConf over the last few years since its inception. But certainly when it first came out, it was definitely a uh, yeah. yeah, probably a bit sure. challenging for most. When there was no tooling or anything like that, I can imagine mm -hmm. it being uh, really challenging. But the idea was once you had it implemented, it was very easy to use. In the sense yeah. that you're, uh, you know, it's it's abstracting away a bunch of the complexity of, uh, you know, atomic operations and sequencing things into the networks and all that good stuff. So um, uh, the last thing I'll add on, and I have a bunch more notes on NetConf, but I, I want to give you a, <laughs> a moment to kind of brain dump some of the stuff you, lo you learned as you were researching this. Um, defined, uh, NetConf itself was defined in, in around 2006. And, and like I said, that's way older than I was expecting. That's like yeah. 14 years, you know, we're in 2020 now. That's a, that's a long time. That was, uh, before I started my career, I was, uh, yep. I was still banging rocks together back then. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. I'll I'll give you a moment to like chime in here and give, give me some brain well, dump. Yeah, I don't even know that I had that much more to add to what you've said so far. I mean, I'm, we're going to get okay. into some of the uh, some of the stuff that has to do with encoding and and yeah. transport protocols and all that. So I, I don't. I mean, I think we can probably just continue on as uh, as you right. see fit. It seems like you're you're, you're on a roll here. So I, I am on a roll. I'll, 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 <laughs> and, and you can chime in as needed. All right. Exactly. Exactly. Um. 
so one one thing I noticed as I was researching Nekomf, um, and we are we are getting closer to the telemetry angle here, but I think it is very very relevant. Is Nekomf was very very much focused on uh, only relying on the data model for configuration and for state, and that is quite key. I think you know. In this, in this world we're in today, and we've seen this push over the last couple of years, this whole like uh, NetOps and Net DevOps, and I think there's two sides to that. There's the whole, you know, using DevOps principles to drive the network and seeing where they fit in uh, from a network mm -hmm. operator's perspective. But I also think there's this whole automations for operations aspect to it as well. And um, I think this is where NetConf really missed the boat. And if I were to, you know, we're now actually going to do a real comparison with GNMI before a brief one anyway, G and I mm -hmm. really focused on solving the operational problem through the data model as well. And I think that is a, a key distinction. And you only need to look at how, like the first version of NetConf, which was, was mainly focused on like a, you know, a bunch of operations around getting the configuration, getting the state, editing the configuration, you know, copying, deleting, locking the data store, unlocking. It was mm -hmm. very, very much focused around kind of configuration semantics. And of course, some functions to allow you to, or RPCs to allow you to uh, to retrieve the state. It wasn't until I think it was 2008, I want to say, that they introduced the, uh, the the concept of event notifications. And, right. you know, I think that's a little telling in that they realized that, you know, we're trying to get rid of SNMP and they were obviously focused on that, the the failure of SNMP for configuration. And so that's where they, all the effort was invested. But the, I guess the goals changed within those two years <laughs> to, yeah. oh, actually we forgot about SNMP traps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so when, when I started looking at event notifications, what I was expecting to find was something akin to kind of subscriptions within GNMI, where you can just, you know, subscribe to a piece of the data model, you can define the path, and you can define the type of subscription. And we'll go into how GNMI does all that in a little bit. But mm -hmm. that's what I was expecting to find. I don't know. What were, you, what were you expecting to find when you started looking at event notifications? Was it, was it the same? Did you uh, I, the same? I, no, actually, I, when I first looked at event notifications, I, I actually uh, assumed trap-like uh, notifications and not subscriptions. And it wasn't until I dug a little bit deeper into it that it looked more and more like a, like a subscription like you're describing, you could potentially do something like streaming telemetry like, but uh, not that you can really, but that then, you know, so, so it looked like to me, like an event notification was more akin to a, an SNMP trap than anything else when I first looked at it. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's what I, that's the intuition I got when I looked at it. But when I heard the concept of event notifications and that that was like their streaming interface, I was thinking, oh, okay, this is how you stream out the data model. This is how I would yep. do like a, subscription on change to look at the data model and it would stream things out, which which was well, the key distinction, right? I think that's because of your background in researching GNMI first, probably. Because it could be. The term the terminology yeah, yeah. seems uh, you know, like it would lead you to 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 believe that it's more like a subscription. Uh yeah. and, and streaming telemetry. But Yeah, for sure. I mean I have my own biases for <clears throat> for sure. Um and coming from kind of the GNMI world first. But I don't know. I mean, if I were to toss up between the two, uh, we'll draw some like rough comparisons. Event notifications is focused on basically packaging SNMP traps within XML and sending them over a streaming interface. That is one mm -hmm. of the uh, event streams that it supports. Um, also syslogs. So the ability yep. to actually bundle syslogs and encode those in XML, or I guess we'll go into some of the other encodings in a little bit and send them over the northbound interface. Um, and they did, uh, actually, I don't know. I'll, I'll pause there. I couldn't find any kind of definitive, uh, what if I wanted to subscribe to the administrative state of the data model? It doesn't seem like event notifications can do it. Maybe I'm wrong, but that, that didn't seem like it, it could sure. do it through the trap side of things in that if the interface goes down, that is a trappable event and you would get a trap for it and you could, you could do it. You could get a notification in that manner, but well, well, there were like three event streams, right? It was like there was SNMP, like you said, syslog, and there was a netconf specific, yeah, uh, event stream, and and um, maybe with through that you could do it, but yeah, it wasn't clear. Yeah, it, it wasn't clear. Maybe we could have gone and looked at an implementation, but I, I think the, the my takeaway from this is that for one, event notifications was 
basically an afterthought. It wasn't what NetConf was really designed for. And at least the initial implementations of it, and from what I've seen from all the examples that I looked at online from vendors who have implemented this, it was really focused around just replacing SNMP traps. And what I thought, and again, this is coming from the GNMI background, is the way you replace uh, SNMP traps is you look for changes within the data model and you stream those out. And that way, you know, a client can decide what is important, what is not important, whether it wants to see it, how frequently it wants to see it, all that good stuff, all the stuff we can get with GNMI. And I mm -hmm. didn't see that. I really didn't see that with uh, event notifications, which I, I think maybe is why, I mean, despite Google being the pusher of open config and, and GNMI, um, I, I think it's, it's probably without debate a better interface um, just from, from doing, kind of doing my rough comparison. To, and again, I'm super biased towards GNMI. Love the interface. GRPC is the best proto for days, baby. Proto is the way of the future. Right. So there is, there is that, that angle to it. And, and for sure, if, if, uh, if you guys disagree with me on, on that, then you can call it out. But I, I do think GNMI was focused more, a lot more on the operational aspects of I don't want to say telemetry, but the operational aspects of a system. And right. I'm not talking about like pings and operational tools, right? I'm, I'm talking about the actual monitoring and the ability to suck data out of the system and react to changes, which is really what SNMP traps are all about. So I think uh, in that respect, uh, GNMI, GNMI for, for, for president. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I, I agree. I have nothing to disagree with there. Um, maybe we can start talking a little bit about the, some of the encoding, maybe the transport of, of NetConf and how that compares to GNMI. Um, yeah. I think, uh, the original NetConf specification, uh, was leveraging SSH for its transport. And I think that was probably, um, from the ease of reusing existing technology you had on your, on your switches at the time. Yep. Um, so, uh, but that, you know, just a, as a comment to that. Uh, upon looking into this further, it turns out it's not the only uh, transport anymore for uh, NetConf. It seems like NetConf, the RFCs for supporting NetConf over TLS, over something called Beep, uh, over SOAP. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I had Beep. never heard this before. <laughs> I hadn't. I hadn't heard about it until I until I looked into NetConf. But the, what I did find is that even though there are RFCs for NetConf over these various transports, most switch and router vendors really only support NetConf over SSH. Like that seems to be the de facto standard even today. Right. Uh, with the exception, I noticed that Cisco does support NetConf over Beep. Beep. And uh, I couldn't find, you know, most other vendors are pretty much NetConf over, over SSH from what I can tell. So that even though there are other ways of, uh, of, of transporting a NetConf uh, uh, RPCs and data across, it, it seems to me like SSH is still the, the predominant transport protocol for that. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I found much of the, the same. So I defined there's an RFC for NetConf over SOAP. Yeah, but again, but again, I had I yet to find a vendor that it, like, it, that implemented that, right? So I'm not sure where that came from and who yeah, implemented yeah. it, but I couldn't find a vendor implementation of it. Yeah, and then NetConf over TLS with, uh, with the X509 as well, which was a more recent RFC, so maybe that just hasn't gained traction yet. Yeah. Uh, and RFC 7549... But yeah, I, I would agree. It seems like everyone kind of decided that the de facto kind of SSH transport is what will be used. And it, yeah. it is one of those things that like once you implement it using SSH, you need motivation to to not use SSH. And, yeah. you know, it's a protocol everyone kind of knew. Everyone knows how to debug SSH. And yeah, I mean, uh, we so what, did discuss So what are the this. challenges? What, what are the challenges with, with, with uh, using SSH? So I think, you know... Um, there's definitely some some uh, performance in setting up an SSH session mm -hmm. uh, that may be challenging. What what else do you uh, what else do you see as challenges with using SSH? Um, I guess like uh, stacking uh, stacking uh, connections together it doesn't really work mm -hmm. nicely over SSH. Whereas you know HTTP, I think in it was one dot one or in two. I can't remember exactly, but the you know the parallelization parallelization of uh of a uh, connection um within a single connection uh although i think i think that was solved i think in netconf there is a concept of running different channels over the same ssh connection oh really that yeah yeah i think interesting. so interesting interesting yeah. no I, I i guess uh there's no real 
downsides to using any transport unless they introduce stupid amounts of like overhead or the handshake is mm -hmm. complex or, or things mm -hmm. like that, right? And certainly using SSH gives you uh, an automatically secure um, uh, connection to the device. Not, not that you can't mm -hmm. do that with HTTP and, and TLS as well, but it's kind of bundled into the protocol or is this kind of an addition with HTTP? So, I mean, I, I can see merits. I, it's not that I, I can't see why it wasn't done. I would argue that the uh, there's probably a little bit of overhead that is unnecessary. Um, I I can't imagine that it's that bad, really. Would, right. would, would, would be what I is would say. Is it optimal? Probably not. Is it awful? Probably not either. It, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean... Uh, it's just, uh, you know, our tendency to reuse what we know. Um, yeah, exactly. And yeah, I, ca I can't really throw stones at it per se, other than saying like, if you were building it from scratch and you had no baggage, would you build it using SSH? Probably not. Um, Probably not. Look at look at GNMI, right? I mean, if you think yeah. of when GNMI came into, into the picture, we haven't really talked about kind of GNMI's history, but I think we both looked it up. It looked like the first commit to GitHub was in, uh, was in 2017. So if you compare that to when NetConf was built, I mean, there's a huge amount of, difference there. And, you know, obviously when you're building GNMI, you have now the ability to potentially use something else. Obviously SSH was not used for GNMI. Um, and that runs over, you know, TLS and HTTP 1.1. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're trying to compare the two, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with using SSH, but there's definitely a better way of doing it. And that's probably the way that GNMI went. And therefore, if you're comparing them, you'd say, you know, plus one for GNMI on transport, but it's not like you're doing anything majorly incorrect by using an SSH and NetConf, and there's not you're not going to have okay. a huge downside to it. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's more on the encoding side that is relevant from a sure yeah from a doing right doing wrong. Then. Yeah. So, um, uh, the main the main encoding that uh, NetConf uses, and we we discussed this in the last episode, is XML, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And I know you looked into it and there, there was a couple of other encodings. Like I think they now support JSON. I think there's actually a binary encoding. There's a I, binary encoding. But again, uh, you know, having said that, I tried to also kind of correlate that to any sort of configurable um, encodings within the vendor uh, operating systems. And it that. wasn't immediately, yeah, well, it wasn't immediately clear to me that there was really much support for anything other than XML. It seems to be like, you know, that's what was used and that's what was implemented. And there are RFCs around supporting different encoding types. And I'm sure there's some operating systems out there that do it and I and I just didn't find them. And it wasn't, you know, in my in my research, my quick research. Uh -huh. um, but it wasn't, it didn't stand out immediately as, a, you know, all vendors support binary encoding for NetConf and all vendors support JSON or whatever it may be, right? Yeah. And so I think um, you and I started to talk about this last night, but I think this is, this is where things can start to get a little bit more relevant, but there's two angles to look at this, and one of them is a little bit more future-proof, and one of them matters to some people and isn't going to matter to others. And I guess to, to start with, XML versus kind of a GNMI encoding. So GNMI, the, the protobuf itself, um, the GNMI spec indicates that the encoding can use like JSON, JSON IETF, ASCII, it can use uh, proto any, but on on the wire you are you're dealing with protobufs. So mm -hmm. and there's there's a, a a huge benefit in performance in dealing with protobufs versus something like an XML. I think I, I looked it up quickly and there's like a three times performance increase for an application kind of deserializing a proto versus an XML. And to put that into context, this doesn't right. matter in a lot of cases, right? That was kind of the point you were making. Um, right. And I, I I agree, but I think uh, if it, it only makes sense once you scale things up a little bit. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is, you know, let's say I have three collectors that are doing NetConf today, NetConf event notifications or, or whatever they may be. And they're all running at 100%. Or just, or just gets even, yeah. Or just gets, um, and they're all running at a hundred percent, and I now need to scale out to a fourth. So those collectors are consuming CPU cycles, they're consuming memory, they're consuming compute resources. Um, arguably, and we are really talking about just serialization and deserialization. There's a bunch of other metrics to this, so you know, don't throw stones at us, please. We're trying to make simple comparisons on purpose. Yeah. Um, you could run that same configuration with a single GNMI collector. 
collecting the same amount of information, assuming like disk IO and, and other bottlenecks aren't being hit. So I think that is a real scenario, granted theoretical and probably not 100% accurate, but that is a real scenario where moving to an interface like GNMI genuinely saves you like real dollars, real OPEX. Um, so from that perspective, I mean, it sounds good. Um, the other perspective, and this is more on the long-term side of things, if you are planning on consuming a bunch of data, like the, what GNMI was really touted for was, you know, streaming tel telemetry, on-chain subscriptions, yeah. the ability to get a bunch of data out of the system very quickly, deserialize it at the other end and, and be able to start yep. crunching and analyzing it. This is super relevant when you think about things like traffic engineering and, you know, using feeding this into like a segment routing controller. And um, we, we know this isn't really where the industry went because we ended up doing like PSAP. And <laughs> but but this is, well, this, this is kind of where, I, you know, um, you know, our discussion was going the other day. We talked about this a little bit was that, you know, for the, for the, the purposes of NetConf and what it was built for, which was, you know, the whole configuration aspect we just talked about. And then some, very like rudimentary monitoring with you know the event notification and and, and the fact that you can do gets yeah. um you know X, 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 xml works right and it isn't until you start building and having requirements for large-scale information gathering maybe and that falls into telemetry and you're gathering a lot more information uh, a lot more state changes uh you need a lot more granular information uh the rate at which you can process the information on a controller like you were saying in terms of like traffic engineering when all that comes into play then the encoding to me makes a lot more sense, and the, and the need to have something like binary you know, encoding on the wire and more efficient uh, uh, serialization and deserialization makes more sense. But I can't. I, NetConf wasn't built for that. Like NetConf is not something you're exactly. going to use to collect yeah. these masses of amounts of data, and therefore the importance of it running XML versus uh, you know Proto. Uh, uh, you know, it, sure, it, it, GNMI. It, it's better, like from a technology standpoint, efficiency, like you described, uh, potentially some actual real world OPEX savings when you're doing all this at scale. Yeah, uh, but for most of what NestConf is used for today, I, I can't see that it makes a huge difference and that it makes a, a difference for you to, to, you know, for one to be like, well, I, I'm, I'm definitely not going to use NestConf because, you know, no, I, I think what so it comes in, it's down so to, inefficient. Do you know, what I, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the same point we were making, right? If is yeah, it course, solving yeah. a real problem? And and, right. and I think arguably no, because NetConf works. Uh, it's only if, uh, I'd, I'd put it another way. If you're building out a new network today, let's go to that green that green field the solution utopian world that, we uh, love. that Chris, we love that so Chris much. Logan hates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, if you go to that world and you're you're building a, a brand new network and you're going to build out like a some kind of telemetry collection infrastructure on top of it, and you're deciding on which interface to choose, or you know, remove telemetry from from the equation. You're you're deciding uh, how you're going to configure your network and how mm -hmm. you're going to retrieve state from your network. You choose GNMI, and you're given the option. You have GNMI or NetConf, and, you, and, you're, right? and you're given the option between NetConf well, and GNMI. Here's a question for you. Yeah. So here's a question for you. Is there any scenario in which you are given the option between NetConf and GNMI? Let's assume equal. Uh, configuration path ability, like they, they use the same models and you can configure and retrieve uh, the same leaves and all that. Uh, is there any, in any world where you would uh, decide that you want to use NetConf over GNMI? Uh, no world that I want to live in. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So if you start like comparing the two protocols and you know why one should use one protocol versus the other, there really isn't any reason to use NetConf if GNMI is available and your northbound interface, your northbound collector, your northbound configuration management system supports both also. So obviously the drivers for going towards uh, NetConf versus GNMI are not going to be most likely down to the technological differences between them. It's going to yeah. be most likely driven by what is your northbound interface or northbound collector or configuration management system supporting. If you're building that from scratch because you're super awesome and you're uh, you're, you're building your own configuration, then, and you and you have GNMI and NetConf available to you as um, configuration and and streaming telemetry and or uh, monitoring systems on the devices. Mm -hmm. There's not really any reason why you don't use NetConf, right? I, I can't think of any, but yeah. maybe well, you can well, enlighten me. With I, yeah, yeah, I, I just I, one came to my mind as I okay, was tell uh, me. because there, me. there isn't there isn't exact feature parity between NetConf and GNMI. That is one okay. thing that is worth calling out. 
Um, okay, let's, let's call so, out the different things there. Yeah, so in terms of gets, they both do gets. In terms of uh, differentiating between data stores, they both do that. So you can get yeah. from state, you can get from config, you can get from uh, candidate, from yeah. candidate, from from running, you can or you know mm -hmm. intended versus applied. You can you can do all that with both interfaces. You mm -hmm. can do transactions with with both interfaces. Um, well, I, actually, I'll, I'll pause there for a second. You kind of can't. <laughs> GNMI doesn't well, really have that concept, right? Right, the transaction concept on GNMI is more closely lined up with how RESTConf works, which is kind of a lack of transaction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, with, with the NetConf, you can define that you want to push changes into the candidate data store. And you can like you, you can build up that configuration. I guess if you're if you're uh, one of the one of the big uh, things that NetConf was trying to push was this whole concept of kind of network wide transactions. And the idea there was that you could, you know, I'm pushing a service out to my network. I'm going to lock the the configuration of these ten systems that I need to touch. I'm then going to push my changes to the candidate data store. And once I've pushed it to all of them and they've all kind of validated, uh, there's also the validate thing which GNOMI doesn't do. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think we can we can understand why when we know who built GNMI, and we'll, we'll get to that after I after I finish doing the comparison. Um, the idea was that once you push it to the candidate and you've done your validation that it will work, that you can kind of set it across the entire network in one fell swoop. Whereas with GNMI, and you you call that RESTConf, RESTConf does work this way as well. Each transaction is kind of self-contained. There is no way to kind of push a change to the candidate data store and have it sit there kind of waiting. Um, mm -hmm. at least not without extending GNMI from its current state today. And, uh, so that, that's, that's, that's one big difference. Um, something like a commit confirmed. And, uh, again, for those of you who, who don't know what that is, that is the ability to basically push a change down or a transaction down to a system and, uh, have the system kind of go into a, again, a locked mode where all it's doing is waiting for you to confirm that that configuration change had the desired effect. And this is really, really useful for something like, uh, you know, let's change. Let's say you're changing like a control plane policer or something like that, and you mm -hmm. happen to funnel your management traffic either in band or for whatever reason it's hitting that same control plane policer. Then you could, in theory, like lock yourself out of the box. And as long as you're using commit confirmed, what will happen is the box will sit there and go, "Okay, I'm waiting for you to confirm this commit was good for whatever predefined or configured timeout you've set." And once you hit the timer, if you don't get a commit confirmed, you roll back the change. So you can kind of make these complex like management changes. And there's still a fear of you getting locked out of the box, but in most cases, the system will be able to roll back. GNMI doesn't do that. There is no commit right. confirmed through GNMI. There is no commit validate through GNMI, which is just to push a change down to the box and say, I don't want you to do anything with this, but just, just, just tell me it's good. Just tell me it's good. Yeah. So yeah. that also doesn't exist within GNMI. So, the, you know, right. the, it's worth calling out that there is not 100% feature parity between the two. I will counter this by saying that that we as an industry shouldn't necessarily be using the devices to do this. And, you, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about this and that the correct way to do this kind of, uh, maybe not the commit confirmed, I'll, I'll put that aside for a second, but... The correct way to do like the validation is to do this off box. Like if you have the ability to, uh, you know, compile the data model. In a lot of cases, you can at least do all of the Yang validation yourself off box using off box, yeah, using standard tools. You can't even spin up like a, a containerized version of your network operating system and you know put that into your CI/CD pipeline, which you're hopefully pushing these changes through, and you're not just you know blindly configuring the network. And yes, we know this isn't reality, and everyone isn't quite there yet, but that is a direction we should be heading in because there's a lot of value from outside of just commit validate um, to go that approach rather than just, you know, push stuff down to the box and, and hope it works. So those are the reasons that they're kind of not in Genoa. At least that's that's my two cents is there's other ways to solve these problems. And we we do tend to rely on the box to do a lot but, of this but stuff. But there still is. Yeah, but there's still, right, exactly. I guess the value you're highlighting is 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 there is there is still some value in in that whole concept of having a transaction and a, and a validation before you're able to commit and a rollback and and yep. not just throwing things at the box and you know expecting it to to work yep. and if it doesn't work for you to throw something else at the box because you've received notification that it, that that whatever Think change you made but didn't, didn't have the things bad then you 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 go and change your code and and change it so yeah um so there is still some value yeah. There is, there is. I again, I just think there's there's better ways to solve that. The commit, the commit validate one. Actually, I'm like I'm like pondering on that myself now. 
And that, that mm-hmm. is actually kind of useful. What I will say is there's ways to do commit validate through GNMI, but they're not really defined in the spec, whereas NetConf actually defines them in the spec itself in the RFC. Yeah. Right. Like there's there's ways to do this with GNMI, and there's implementations of this out there today where by default you can like set a configuration knob within the system via GNMI that says, I want you to do commit confirmed for every commit. Um, right. And then you can push a change down and it'll go into commit confirmed. And then you can go and set another field to say, yep, that was good. So there's ways to do these without them kind of living inside the kind of interface layer. If they're going to be done, I would argue that they are better done by the interface layer. So in this case, you know, kudos to NetConf. Um, we, we can tell like by 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 the who designed GNMI and uh <laughs> You know, this is not a, a mode that they operate in, right? This is not a mode that Google operates in. They're going to do all this validation yeah. off box. Their kind of mode is I just want to push everything down to the box and then I'm going to validate state by retrieving state, you know, maybe using on change telemetry and have this all ingested by a northbound controller and it's going to decide if things are good and what made it in and and what doesn't. And this is actually pretty interesting when we, we divulge to another topic we've already kind of discussed, which is around potentially the rib and the fib and what is in hardware not matching, which is a, you know, that's a real thing. It can happen where your fib manager or your fib process is pushing stuff down into the ASIC, but you know, there's, there's table exhaustion or something and it's not noticed Mm -hmm. or otherwise those routes don't make it in. And uh, this whole, this whole approach of kind of closed loop validation, you can call it intent, you can call it whatever you want is definitely useful. And it's probably the direction we should all be heading in anyway. So, right. That's my uh, so so yeah. There's not full feature parity, and if you're someone that likes to use those features through a machine-driven interface, then GNMI doesn't necessarily um, Meet cover the need. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But outside of that, use GNMI. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty big one, I think. I think I think in the networking world, people are still very reliant on this whole idea of transactions and mm. and auto rollback and uh, validation and like that. That's still a predominant way of consuming a a network device or like how you would configure a network device. So yeah, that could be pretty big. I think that may be something that uh, holds a lot of people back from from going the GNMI route. <clears throat> but then again, RESTConf exists. So, you know, for those who are using RESTConf, RESTConf you would have a similar um, capability in GNMI. Yes, yeah. So we are getting to RESTConf. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I don't have too many notes on RESTConf. So uh we can just we can dive through this pretty quickly. So uh, very, very high level, RESTConf is a, uh, an HTTP interface that uh, the encoding is, is JSON. Um, so they get to use all the HTTP stack in terms of TLS and all that good stuff. They're also using the normal HTTP uh, kind of methods for manipulating data on a server. So this is your typical, it's a proper REST compliant interface in that, you know, you can do gets and posts and puts and patches and deletes and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Now there's downsides to that, of course, and uh, very similar to GNMI actually, in that it's not really transaction based. It's still batched, like that is worth calling out. And so is GNMI, it is still batched mm-hmm. in the sense that, you know, if you're mm-hmm. building a service, you don't need to build the network instance first. One at a time, separately. yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they are, they are still batched. Um, doesn't support validation, just like GNMI doesn't. So there is no commit validate command. Um, one thing we didn't call out is all these interfaces support kind of a capabilities RPC where you can kind of query a device on what it does support in terms of data models and all that kind of thing. RISCConf is the same. GNMI has the capabilities RPC. So does uh, NetConf. They all have mechanisms for, hey, tell me how to talk to you, basically. Um, right. So that is worth calling out. Uh, I think RISCONF also supports XML, but I don't know why you, you would use XML unless you're also using NetConf. And if you're using NetConf, I don't know why you're using RISCONF. Um, but I, I think primarily implementations will be using JSON because that is kind of nicer to read. Now, my, my two cents on RISCONF, like why I think it exists, is that it um, it provides that simpler implementation piece. So we talked about that with SNMP versus NetConf, right? It's very, very easy for me to kind of define something I want to do on the box in, in some pretty clean JSON that's modeled after the data model. And then just to do like a, like a, a curl to put the data or a wget to push yeah. the data. And, you know, implementing a GNMI interface within like a script is, uh, it's doable. 
And especially if you're using like external libraries, um, uh, 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 Roman Doden actually, who, who gave us the, the feedback for this episode, he has a really, really cool uh, a GNMI client called GNMIC. I think he worked on it with uh, some some friends. And so you could, you could pull these into your scripts and use them, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, you know, that's not as simple as just posting <laughs> posting some JSON to a web server, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, that was my two cents about why it existed. Um, again, it was kind of, uh, I think the RFC uh, was defined in January 2017. So right before the GNMI first commit happened. <laughs> Same year. And I think familiarity, fam familiarity for like uh, developers that, they, I mean, they understand an interface like RESConf much more they would, uh, than they would understand something like NetConf. Yeah, like for them, uh, the 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 CRUD functions of, of a REST interface and the principles behind REST are well known in many other areas and industries in IT and 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 uh, and so it was made. Ma I think it was mainly about bringing those principles to being able to configure a switch or a yeah. router, right? Yeah. Um, and not having to rely on this completely separate way of doing things through NetConf. So um, I think it, it, it net red. Uh, RESTConf versus NetConf again comes down to what yet northbound management interface looks like, who built it, and how they wanted to interact with the devices, and you know what they're willing to put up with in terms of um, some of the things you talked about, with lack of lack of uh, transactions and so on and so forth, but gaining a more friendly and common interface that was maybe easier for their developers to to attach themselves to and, and interface with. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it should be stated that, like, uh, <clears throat> they don't support transactions in the sense that you can do network-wide transactions. All these interfaces Correct. support device-level transactions. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, that is that is worth calling out. Okay. So um, I think I think RESTConf is just a simplified NetConf. I think uh, if you're writing a script, you're a lot more likely to, to utilize something like a RESTConf interface, if it's available. Even over mm -hmm. something like a like a GNMI potentially for all the reasons I stated, right? GNMI is a fairly complex interface. Like we're not talking about you know network engineers just hacking up scripts here. That's that's uh, that's definitely going to be more akin to RESTConf than something like GNMI or even NetConf, just because the mm -hmm. uh, the interface itself is relatively complex. So I think it definitely has its place for some of those more simple automations. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's that's all I that's, those are all the notes I took on myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yep. Okay. Um moving on, the final interface. We've already done a bunch of the comparisons. So there's we another one. To, yeah, GNMI. We haven't actually talked too Oh, much you want about to talk specifically yet. about GNMI. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess we didn't really cover what it does necessarily, right? We 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 covered that in the context of NetConf. And what That's true. We did compare does. it, but yeah, from the perspective of NetConf. Okay, so yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so uh, a few, uh, very, very similar to NetConf in that it exposes a bunch of different RPCs. One thing I did notice that was quite interesting, and I kind of wanted to pick your brain on this a little, is the way GNMI has gone about splitting out the data store from the RPC. So... If we look at the uh, some of the RPCs that are supported, and I guess we'll just focus on the GETs for now because that's where this is kind of relevant. There's a GET mm -hmm. RPC, which gets configuration and state within NetConf. There's a GET config RPC, which gets the configuration. And there, well, actually, no, those are the two on NetConf because that's what all we're focusing on. On the GNMI side, there's just GET. And within GET, you can specify a data store. So now this is probably semantics. I don't think it really matters which, which way around you go, but I do think it does allow GNMI to focus more on supporting additional data stores. And I think that's relevant when you consider um, some of the operational commands that might exist. So we're like, we've only really talked about the main data stores here, right? So we have a candidate mm -hmm. data store. That's the, can the configuration that's not yet applied. We have the running data store, uh, which is uh, akin to like the intended the configuration, config. the running yeah. configuration. There's a state data store, which deals or the uh, applied configuration, which is a combination of your running configuration and any kind of dynamic state that, uh, that the box itself has generated. So those are the three main data stores we talk about, but there are potentially others. Um, I guess the, the the big one being something like an operational data store where, you know, you might want to do sets for operational commands. Like you might expose like a, a reboot, a reboot of a system. 
Or like a, a reset of a BGP neighbor or something. Exactly. Some of these like OAM yeah. style commands that we would typically yeah. run through CLI. I don't really see a way of doing that with something like NetConf. Whereas with GNMI, you know, you, you just extend, you add another data store. Life's good. You can do sets against it. Could have its own schema in theory. Mm-hmm. Um, although just from a muscle memory perspective, ideally it doesn't. But could have its own schema. Um and this is where I think GNMI recognize that the main functions for accessing data in a device, that being, you know, I want to retrieve something, I want to set something, or I want to subscribe to something. At a very high level, that's that's all you're really looking to do. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas the data stores themselves could grow over time. And again, this is, this is my GNMI fanboyism coming through. I think they made the right call here in that, you know, trying to do operational commands with a netconf would require defining a bunch of different RPCs. Right. Which, you know, yeah. if, if I was someone that was trying to build a NOS today and base it all around netconf, I would need to go and build augmentations Extend. or proprietary implementations. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what's Word. interesting is that is restconf uh, has a get function and it doesn't separate. You have to specify um, as part of the... Uh, the content uh, parameter query, you have to specify where you want to get the data, the data from, the get from. But it doesn't have, like, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's like, really like data stores, but it's like you specify config or non-config or all, and mm-hmm. that's how you retrieve the different information. But it's a single function, whereas in netconf, it is get and then there's get config, which is what you're talking about here. And then in GNMI, yep. you do a get and you can explicitly call out the actual data store. So it's almost like netconf, you can't specify the data store Really, I mean, it, it retrieves it based on the function you're calling. It retrieves it from the, the, the correct data store. Yeah. And then RESTConf, it's kind of like there's a single function, and then you don't really specify the data store, but you kind of specify what you're trying to get if you want config or all. And then there's, or not nothing con- non-config, I guess, would be just state. And then yeah. there's GNMI, which is the, the third way, which is I'm actually going to specify explicitly which data store I want to perform the action against, whether it be get or set or whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's a it's a it's a minor thing. We don't have that many more data stores yet. Um, no, but I I do think the primitives of what that kind of machine interface is doing, like I said, get set and subscribe, uh, lead the GNMI model to being the more sane model in in my mind. Um, and you you can see this by the number of RPCs that are supported through something like GNMI versus uh, NetConf. And to be fair. NetConf does all those extra things we talked about, and they, of course, mm-hmm. have their uh, their own RPCs for them. But it's like uh, it's like four or five versus like fifteen. <laughs> yeah. So RPCs in NetConf are uh, a dime a dozen. <laughs> dime a dozen. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, focusing focusing in on GNMI. Obviously, this is a gRPC uh, over HTTP uh, style interface. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a GNMI proto, which allows you to very easily kind of take that proto, um, run it through like a proto compiler for whatever language you're trying to build a GNMI client in. And uh, you can kind of build your own clients quite easily in that manner. Um, supports capabilities. I mentioned that like all the other interfaces do. <laughs> supports gets and you can specify the data store. You can specify paths. The path, the, the, the way paths are defined in GNMI is the one thing I guess it's it takes a little while to get your head around. Like the the path uh, LM notation that they use, uh, I think it's called like text proto or something. Is yeah. uh, it, it, it's a little confusing. Like I, I mean, I I see why it was done because it allows you to have hierarchy um, within a single message. But you know, something like XPath or uh, and, and you know XML has kind of the same problem. The XML notation for I just want to query a path is like insane you look at it and you're like yeah. wow there's a lot of namespaces there <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of columns yeah um so uh, so yeah genomai has kind of their own kind of path uh path syntax i guess um mm-hmm. sets are, are, are i guess fairly fairly simple they support you know updates and replaces and stuff like that similar to all these other interfaces subscribe is uh where genomai really shines in my mind and again Two ways, two ways to do this, or I guess there's multiple ways to do this in terms of uh, kind of event notifications. One is to rely on something like an SNMP trap and just to change the encoding and the interface that's being sent over, uh, aka NetConf. Um, mm-hmm. The other is uh, to actually stream fields changing value. 
Uh, and this requires a lot of work. For those of you who don't know, there's a few different ways to subscribe to state within GNMI. Um, the obvious one is uh, is on change. Is what most people use. Um, there is also as soon as, uh, the, as soon as the the that value changes, it punts an update up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what is super interesting about this is it needs to be implemented within the application, because this is a this is basically is a hook that that is embedded at the time that field is changing within the code. So on change right. is actually relatively complex unless you fake it and you poll things and then treat them like they're on change. But the way this is done properly is actually relatively complex. And this is why adopting GNMI, especially the subscribe side of GNMI, has been a bit of a long haul for vendors mm -hmm. and that, you know, going mm -hmm. through everywhere that they're changing uh, some field in the data model and creating a hook there in case there's an on change subscription is uh, that's work. Um, right. Few other types of subscriptions are uh, once being a, uh, I want you to do a get, but I want you to do it over a subscribe RPC, which is going to be more efficient if you're sending a, like a lot of data. A lot of data, um, yeah. On change, we talked about sample as in, sample. A, yeah, every every defined period, whatever that might be, 10 seconds is pretty typical. Uh, send me the updates. And then poll, which uh, allows a collector to kind of ingest things at the rate it wants. So basically you set up a subscription and say, I, I'm looking for these paths. And then whenever you want to get data, you send a, uh, a poll across the session and GNMI will punt everything. Um, some cool stuff they did to try and inhibit the amount of data that a collector has to deal with is they have things like updates only. So when you create a subscription, you get everything. But from then on, it's not like you're getting the entire root path and everything below it every 10 seconds or anything like that. You can get just the bits that have changed, which is very, very, yep. very nice. It allows you to kind of stay in sync with the network. The other thing they did is target defined subscriptions. And I think these are super cool in that you can allow a system to basically figure out how frequently it wants to send things on a field by field basis. And basically that's up to the the vendor to decide how frequently something should be sent. So which, which probably ties back to uh, which probably ties back to the whole like complexity of implementing something. Yeah, you know what I mean. It allows it allows yeah. the the network operating system and the vendor to really define what interval that they deem mm -hmm. accept, acceptable for for them to be able to send uh, data because there may be performance issues and they may want to put some limits around you know what what they can or cannot do. So if you say you know target defined, then you know as a as a collector you're you're saying well whatever you can do let me know and send it to me on that interval and I'll, I'll happily accept it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think target to find, like you said, is to solve some of the complexity of subscribing to paths and getting too much information, not getting enough information. Yeah. If you're doing something target to find is kind of like that sweet spot where in most cases, and again, it's up to the vendor, they could do whatever craziness they want, but in most cases, they're going to send you statistics sampled and they're going to send you any other kind of event things on change. And this kind of brings us full circle, I think, to this whole event stuff. And I, I do think this is where NetConf, I don't want to say they messed up, but I, I do think this is where GNMI really shines in that the ability to A, get a, a bunch of data out of the box. And we can we already kind of talked on the relevance of that. And if it is relevant, mm -hmm. in some cases it is, some cases it's not. But the ability to drive the events using the data model, I think was the correct decision. It gets us away from kind of that trap style behavior where you don't really know if that trap is the current state or it's the state at the time you received it or if a message was maybe dropped. I guess we're not using SNMP anymore. So on, over SSH, that shouldn't happen. But right, yeah, I think that is a, that is one case where I think GNMI actually does shine. Um, I guess you could argue that you can get more over NetConf, like you could do syslog over, over NetConf. There is nothing stopping you from dumping your syslogs into a path within the data model and streaming that on change. So it's not that you can't do this using GNMI, but I don't, I don't know yeah. if anyone is doing that. I don't like, think anybody is. Yeah, I don't think anybody is doing yeah. that. Now. Yeah, it really just seems like GNMI. I mean, it just seems like a, a natural evolution of technologies. If you look at, at, you know, we discussed the reason why there was a change from SNMP to NetConf, and that was with regards to trying to have a better configuration interface. Monitoring seemed to be okay within SNMP, and in fact, still is today uh, by a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. sadly. Uh, but it, you know, so the, the, you could see the driver for that. And then, for sure, you know, G GNMI came along and it was trying to solve 
uh, maybe another problem in that it was trying to collect more information, optimize around telemetry, and while doing so, it's also able to provide um, some some modernizations around configuration, optimizations with uh, uh, serialization, deserialization on the on the wire, optimizations with regards to the transport protocol, maybe, um, yeah. and maybe some other ones. And th the only fundamental, really like huge difference in terms of the uh, configuration aspect is like we talked about with the whole. Um, be able to validate in the whole like uh, transaction that we, we talked about it. So we won't, won't rehash it. But other, other than that, it just seems like a, like a logical kind of like leap next in technology step. to next step. And exactly. And, and that's how you, you just have the a next, next generation management interface, which allows you to do configuration in the same, very similar way to net to a net conf. Mm -hmm. um, it allows you to do uh, monitoring and events in the, in a much better way than SNMP. And it allows you to do like proper streaming telemetry for, you know, uh, the, the next gen use cases of, of, of doing maybe controller based uh, TE or anything that you want to do with, with collecting large amounts of data from your device, right? So it just seems like a logical next step, a logical leap, and, and people should use it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they should. One other thing, I, I was just, I was doing some math while, uh, while you were talking. It took us about 20 years to create another management interface in NetConf. Like I'm, I'm going back to when SNMP mm -hmm. was kind of, kind of found, which was back in 1988 or whatever. So it was like, what, 18 years. Um, and it took us uh, around about another 10, if I were to round up for, for a GNMI. So if, uh, if there's one thing we've learned is that technology is starting to iterate faster. It's uh, like things mm -hmm. are evolving faster and we're often optimizing more frequently than we used to, for sure. Um, I think GNMI has, uh, I mean, there's going to be another interface in a decade, I'm, I'm sure. Like I said, we're all going to mm -hmm. be uh, dead wrong in a decade's time when there's another new interface and GNMI sucks. And <laughs> that, that's, that's, yeah. pro that's probably going to happen. Maybe it's in five years. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but it's, it, it really is kind of a leapfrog from a telemetry standpoint. I know we weren't trying to focus on, on the telemetry side of things. I think... The big change here is how you monitor the network and how you drive yeah. kind of the operation side of things. Whereas, like you said, NetConf was focused on configuration. That was the problem it was trying to solve. Yep. I think arguably, like it did a pretty good job. It's fairly feature rich. Yep. Um, yep. And even uh, today, like like we discussed, like we discussed, even today. I mean, if you were just yep. comparing and and you had a blank slate between the two, it comes down to how much emphasis you want to put on some of the stuff NetConf brings to the table. Yeah, uh, and has brought to the table with transactions and all that, and you know, other than that, it's 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 pretty good. It's pretty good, guys. It's, yeah, this one it's takeaway, that's it. It's pretty good, but GNMI is probably better. I think Nikonf was a nice transition. If if nothing else, like it got people used to driving things using the models, which was needed, right? There was there was a big uplift over uh over SNMP, but it mm -hmm. it only really focused on the configuration and. I guess state side. It did state as well, but Gene and I really focused on the uh, the monitoring side, and not just you know polling state every every one hour. Like you know, we still do that with SNMP today. I don't know about one hour, but I, I sure I'm sure everyone is doing like a a bulk walk against their systems at some point to try and resynchronize things because SNMP is using UDP and things get out of step. And are you sequencing your trap IDs and all that good stuff? I mean, uh, yeah, you know, we're we're just getting we're getting better at keeping things in sync. We're getting better at defining interfaces that uh, allow kind of the bulk retrieval and and setting for that matter of uh, of data. And in this 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 brand new utopia world that we live in, um, we are eventually going to start making more and more decisions off box. Like that's just a, a reality. It comes in waves. We go from centralized through distributed through centralized through distributed. We seem to be on the on the centralized path right now, where we're you know segment routing being a, a big factor in that, making T decisions mm -hmm. off box, given a much wider set of data. Your ability to ingest that data rapidly and to be able to do it efficiently is important. Whether or not you're using that functionality now, and uh, I guess that's always been the argument, right? Is most networks aren't doing real TE even today, where they were doing TE, but then RSVP TE wasn't scaling, so they moved to LDP. And they just started doing, using RSVP for fast reroute. And, <laughs> and then we had TILFA, so they didn't need to do that anymore. I mean, we've gone through waves. I think we're at that point where we're going back to central. Controllers are going to save the world. 
and uh, they're going to make our networks more efficient. So you need GNMI for that. So there you go. There you go. There's your answer, GNMI versus uh, NetConf. Yeah. I think we actually have a use decent GNMI. conclusion on this one. <laughs> use GNMI. <laughs> Unless you have to use uh, something else. Unless you have to use something else, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that seems like a natural place to end, I think. I agree. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the feedback that drove most of this uh, this episode, guys. And of course, yeah, I'm that was awesome. Sure, uh, we're gonna get some more after this episode. And any more topics? Any more topics you want us to cover? I think we've got a we've got lined up another another data models V two part two, I should say. Yeah. Uh, coming up based on some other feedback we got uh, from the very first data models episode we did. So, uh, but yeah, any other topics you want us to cover? Um, comments twitter youtube linkedin absolutely wherever we're Let available everywhere mm -hmm. most places anyway <laughs> yep most important places let's go with that cool all right thanks for tuning in guys we hope this was uh was an interesting episode definitely fun for us to go and do the research on this um yep but like I said, we we come from the GNMI side of the fence, and you know we'll, we'll shamelessly admit that. Uh, I I at least like to think that we took a relatively unbiased approach on on this one. Um, I learned a lot about NetConf while while researching this, so uh, that was that was some good fun. Understanding the motivations make bring things into a, a bit of a clearer picture. I think like uh, perspective, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, alrighty, we can wrap up. Cool. Cue the outro. All right. We will see you in the yeah. next one. Have a good one. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. As always, please do let us know any feedback or criticisms you may have. We can be reached on Twitter, YouTube, or our website, ntwr.kn, where you'll find this episode and many others posted. For those of you on YouTube, if you liked the episode, please hit that thumbs up button. And if you didn't like the episode, feel free to hit the thumbs down button twice. On a side note, you know those cliche, these are our opinions and not that of our employer statements you hear all the time? Yeah, we unfortunately have to make one of those. The benefits of working in the industry we want to publicly have an opinion about. We've done our best to remove bias, but we're only human and we make mistakes just like you. Thanks again. We'll see you in the next one.